All right, what is going on, everybody? How is everybody doing today? Welcome here today to another episode of the Just Ballin Podcast. It is Friday, April 5th, and we're gonna be doing pretty much just like a mailbag today. I was thinking of just doing like five Idea Fridays, and I got five mailbag questions, and I think it's gonna hit kind of different aspects of the NBA and kind of different scenarios that I thought were interesting. So I'm going to be answering those five comments to like be those five things that we are going to talk about. Um, Big news just kind of came out that Bronny James is declaring for the 2024 NBA draft, but is still remaining his transfer portal eligibility. So there is a deadline for, I believe when you have to fully commit into the NBA draft, then you start your workouts, go through the combine. So he probably has to wait till make his decision till then, but he can probably get a feel from GMs. He can kind of conduct, I guess, like interviews and stuff and see if he has a chance to go in the first round, go in the second round. And obviously for Bronny, it's a different scenario because it's the son of LeBron James. So there's still that thing kind of looming over would LeBron sign with whatever team that drafts Bronny. That is a possibility. So um, there's a chance that Bronny could go in the first round because of that. If LeBron wants to go back to Cleveland to play with his son there, he could do that. And uh, he could sign with the Cavs on a one-year deal and, and the Cavs can well, the Cavs don't have their first round pick. Oh no, the Cavs do have their first round pick. So the Cavs could just kind of take Bronny and go from there. Um, I don't know if like a team like the Thunder would do this. I, I don't know. Like obviously you'd want LeBron James, but you're getting what a 40, 41 year old LeBron. Um, I don't know. It, it's definitely a, a situation we've never seen before. If I had to guess, I, I still think Bronny goes back to college. I don't think he's NBA ready. And I think he'd be better suited off at like Duquesne or but like, I don't know though because if Bronny like transfers to Duquesne or if it's Ohio State or uh, maybe a major school and he has a very similar year which I don't think he will because I think he's still a good player but if he has like a relatively similar year to what he did at USC and LeBron retires or LeBron is like I don't know it's a different scenario in a year from now it's a different kind of idea on what he could do if he wants to play with his son would it be worth it right this may be Bronny's best chance to be a quote-unquote first round pick sign a four-year contract in the NBA and maybe play in April basketball right we're seeing these random guys play right now that could be Bronny next year and that's when he could play with his dad if they are on the same team but I I think if Bronny does go into this draft, he will be a first round pick I think teams would probably like his potential more than like a Tyler Colix obviously but if you're drafting like a Tower Kolek out of Marquette, you probably are in a different situation. Like if you're Minnesota, right? Do you want to develop a Bronny James or would you rather have somebody that could be a backup point guard next year? Would you rather get an AJ Mitchell out of Santa Barbara? Would you rather get uh, a Trey Alexander out of Creighton um, or one of those guys? But if it comes down to DJ Wagner or Bronny James, I think I could lean Bronny if that's a chance I can give LeBron or if it's Justin Edwards or Bronny James or one of these like extreme raw prospects, which Bronny is, um, I, I don't hate that. And I think Bronny could still develop into that Javon Carter, Miles McBride, maybe at his peak, Marcus Smart uh, archetype in the NBA. So it will be pretty interesting to see what happens. If I had to guess, I mean, I, I don't know. My guess is probably that he goes to, I think he stays his sophomore year in college and maybe ends up at like a Duquesne. Hopefully his scoring looks a little bit better and he still has a chance to be a first round pick next year. But if he does want to play with his dad and vice versa, this is probably the year to do it. And he's going to declare for the 2024 NBA draft. So um, yeah, let's get into this. Basically, uh, we're going to talk about uh, first. I just want to give my final four predictions for the um, the men's tournament. I mean, it's pretty much a given. I mean, Purdue's a nine and a half point favorite and UConn is an 11 and a half point favorite. Um, Purdue against NC State, uh, UConn against Alabama. Um, I'm going to predict Purdue UConn if I do think one team has a better chance at upsetting a team. I don't know. Because Alabama is definitely better than NC State, uh, but NC State has beaten a lot of good teams in this tournament, like just came off a win against Duke, and we'll see if DJ Burns can somewhat slow down Zach Eady. I don't think he will. Um, but then again, I'm like, all right, NC State probably has a better chance of pulling off the upset. Um, it's even a closer spread. But then I'm like thinking like Alabama's running gun offense, like Mark Sears has been on a kind of a terror as of late in the tournament. And that could be somewhat of UConn's kryptonite because UConn can run, but they also like to slow down the game a little bit and run their half court sets. And if Alabama could make them uncomfortable, and I think that was a big reason why people thought Houston could beat UConn if they ever face each other, because Houston is phenomenal in the half court defensive sets. Could that be a reason that maybe UConn could uh, end up losing in the final four? So if I had to guess, like my predictions though, it's going to be UConn over Alabama and I'm going to take um, Purdue over NC State. I still like UConn to win it all. That was my um, initial prediction when the season started. That was my prediction um, to start off March Madness. So I'm going to ride with it. They are still the best team and they haven't shown me any reason why they aren't going to win the national championship. Um, They have been blowing out their opponents left and right. I don't even know if Alabama will be the best team that they have faced in the tournament so far. Like Illinois was on a great run. They won the Big Ten tournament and they um, destroyed them. They went on a 30-0 run. They won 
77-52. I wouldn't say like San Diego State was a great team. I wouldn't say Northwestern or obviously Stetson aren't great teams. So this could be the toughest test for UConn, but there's a chance. Like I really wanted to see like Zona or UNC play UConn. And unfortunately, we're not going to get that. It would have been cool to see the rematch from the Jimmy V Classic between UNC and UConn um, because I wonder like what Baycott would do against Donovan Klingon, uh, like Harrison Ingram on like um, either Cam Spencer or uh, if he had a guard, um, Alex Caravan. I don't know. It would have been a little bit more interesting or like I said, if Arizona was in that. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't get that. But it should still be a fun Final Four weekend. I'm hoping some of these games are close. But if we do get Purdue and UConn, that will be a very fun national championship game because those two teams are arguably the two best teams in all basketball and they college basketball and they've been the two best teams in college basketball all year long um purdue went 33 and 4 uconn 35 and 3 and it would be a very fun national championship game so um i actually i don't um because i'm gonna actually be away sunday to wednesday i'm going to atlanta so if you're ever at, if you're at the mets braves game monday night i'll be there or if you're at the uh, hawks heat game tuesday night i will also be there um but i think i'll give my i'm gonna record like a pre-record a monday podcast before I leave and I'm gonna it's gonna be kind of college focus I'm gonna talk about like the 10 best teams I think uh like college teams since 2010 and I'll give my final prediction there um I'm not sure if I'm gonna record that before or after the final four it may be because <laughs> uh, if I record it before the final four it's gonna be tough to give a prediction there but I'm gonna go UConn over Bama Purdue over NC State I know it's chalk um I if I had to think who upsets a team more I honestly want to say Bama upsets UConn more, um, even though UConn is better than Purdue, in my opinion. Um, but I don't know. I think Bama has a chance to pull off the upset. Do I want them to? No, I want to see UConn-Purdue. I think that'll be the best final um, or the best national championship game possible. So let's see. All right. So the first question is going to come in from Clutch Basketball here of the mailbag. And he says, who was your main dark horse team in the playoffs for both conferences. So I guess we can kind of look at past years. Like um, we could look back in like the 2021 playoffs, right? Like the Atlanta Hawks going on a run, upsetting the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, 2022 playoffs, the Dallas Mavericks going on a little bit of a run into the conference finals, upsetting the... Um, upsetting the Golden State Warriors, or excuse me, the Phoenix Suns. Um, and that was the infamous, like, uh, Chris Paul hits a huge three down 40. Um, and even last year, like, you can think, like, the Lakers going on a run as a seven seed or the Heat going on a run as an eight seed. Like, who is your dark horse team to maybe make it to the conference finals? I think that'd be the peak. I'm not expecting a dark horse team to win it all. But from both conferences, um, we could start off with the West. It's tough, because obviously you could say the Lakers again, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I think my dark horse team would be the New Orleans Pelicans if they are fully healthy. So that means like they get Brandon Ingram back, ready to go full strength for the playoffs. They recently got Dyson Daniels back. And I think they do have a chance to be somewhat of a dark horse. So right now, as it currently stands, they are the seventh seed. It's going to be really tough if they ended up getting Denver round one. Like if Minnesota ends up getting the one seed um, and they win their first leg of the playing tournament, I'd rather play Minnesota in round one than Denver, obviously. So I guess it really depends on who like the round one matchups be because if New Orleans, who is my Dark Horse Western Conference team, ends up getting uh, Denver round one, they shouldn't have been my Dark Horse team. But I don't know if they're facing Denver in round one. Uh, for Brandon Ingram, it looks like he's going to be reevaluated uh, in two weeks. This came out about two weeks ago. So there is a chance he comes back for the playoffs. Um, and if he's at full strength, I do think that this team could be a Western Conference team. Uh, finals contender. Uh, their defense is off the charts. They're a top five defensive team this year. They have an above average offense. Um, I've enjoyed it a lot more with we're kind of seeing Point Zion. We could see a little bit more of CJ McCollum off ball. Obviously, Trey Murphy is a lethal off ball. And then you want to slow it down in your half court set and you need an ISO play. McCollum can still give you that, but a healthy Brandon Ingram could also give you that as well. And Brandon Ingram still has some great playmaking ability to him. And this team is going to disrupt you defensively. Jordan Hawkins can provide some nice defense for somebody that's a rookie. Herb Jones is going to be on all defensive first team, or at least he should be, in my opinion. Um, there are some mismatches at the five spot with Jonas Valanciunas for sure. And that's why if they end up going up against, I don't know, if they end up going up against Denver, it's going to be very tough for them in the playoffs. Um, but Dyson Daniels can also provide some good defense as well. Like this team is going to disrupt you defensively. Um, but the only weakness I think is what their big man depth is going to look like. Do I trust Jonas Valanciunas? Do I trust Larry Nance? Do I trust Jeremiah Robinson Earl if he were to get minutes in the playoffs? Um, or Cody Zeller? No, not at all. Um, I think it would be perfect if they matched up with Honestly, any team besides Denver. I think they could beat Minnesota. I think they could beat OKC. I think they could beat the Clippers, Mavericks, Suns, Kings, Lakers, Wars. I think they could beat any team in this Western Conference playoffs in a seven-game series. And the only team I don't like is Denver because of that mismatch at the five. And that's the mismatch you don't want because it's Nikola Jokic on your team. And they have the playoff experience and have the role players and the well-balanced team with Jokic out there. I don't think it's a great team with Jokic not on the four. And that's what they would have to kind of take advantage of or any team in the playoffs specifically. 
I mean, I know that the Pelicans really need to work on their pick and roll sets. I think they're one of like the least ran pick and roll teams, um, according to Synergy this year. And it's just a weird set. And this team, if they got like an upgrade at the five spot, I think they could be a dark horse contender uh, to win the finals next year. And I'm excited to see what they do in this offseason because they could have multiple first round picks depending on what they want to do with that Lakers pick. And they had those future Milwaukee Bucks picks as well from the Drew Holiday trade. So I, I think Denver, or excuse me, I think New Orleans is in position to make a run, but it all really just depends on who they get matched up in the first round. I think if we went back to that like Atlanta series in 21, like they got the Knicks in round one, that was a favorable matchup for them in hindsight. And then a chance to pull off the upset on Philadelphia, who has never gone to a conference final. So you kind of have to get lucky there, but I'm sure if Atlanta ended up facing Milwaukee or Boston in round two, or whoever it ended up being, um, we'll say Milwaukee in round two, it wasn't going to be pretty for them, right? Um, so I, I think New Orleans, I don't think Sacramento, especially with their injuries that they have going on right now. I mean, the Lakers can still make a run. I still think they're good enough to beat any team in this conference besides Denver. Like when you have LeBron James and you have D'Lo and Hashimura and all these guys kind of heating up at the right time, the Lakers could definitely make a run. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about the Suns' depth. And I think they're big men. Their lack of big man depth could hurt them as well. Uh, Dallas is so hit or miss. Uh, Clippers are so hit or miss with their health. Um, and then I don't think really Minnesota or OKC would be considered a dark horse just because of how good they've been throughout the regular season. So for the Western Conference, my dark horse pick will be the New Orleans Pelicans. And for the Eastern Conference, it definitely was going to be, I think, like no bias aside like, or no bias here, but the New York Knicks. And I think there's a chance the Knicks could still make it to the conference finals. But with the news that Julius Randle is going to be out for the year, it's definitely going to hurt them. Now, if we looked at the most, the three playoff series that Julius Randle has been with the Knicks, 2021 against Atlanta and 2023 against Cleveland and Miami, he's not been good. He's been inefficient, takes bad shots, does not hustle back on defense. So you could be like, Matt, this is somewhat of a net positive, but the Knicks did not really address their issue last year against Miami in round two. They did not really add a secondary shot creator and you would hope that would be Julius Randle. That's why I thought maybe in the offseason they'd go after um, DeMar DeRozan if they felt like RJ Barrett wasn't gonna take that step. And now that they moved RJ for quickly for OG and Anobi, and I love that trade still, and it's looking positive that OG will be playing for the playoffs, I don't think OG is gonna be that guy to step up. Deontay DiVincenzo and Josh Hart are good offensive players, but not somebody when Jalen Brunson's getting double teamed at the top, you could throw it to and rely on an ISO. They're more catch like Dante's more of a catch and shoot three point guy that could be inconsistent. Um, it's it's like one night he's shooting three for ten from three, three for twelve from three. Other nights he's like six for eleven. Like it's like an on and off night sometimes with DiVincenzo if he's like the secondary or if he's the number two offensively, which we've seen with the injuries too. Randall and OG and Obi and Josh Hart's more of like I think a, a chaotic score like when um it's in fast break or he drives inside it doesn't look pretty it can kind of go in but Josh Hart like open threes it doesn't go in as much as you would have liked it to so um I don't think the Knicks are gonna have that unless Ann and Obi I don't think he's gonna turn into someone that's gonna average 20 plus points in the playoffs on good efficiency especially with the elbow injury he's gonna be more of a defensive guy for them so I don't think that the Knicks have a chance I do think if the Knicks get Orlando or Cleveland um, or if it's somehow Indiana in round one, they could beat them. Um, but I, I don't think this Knicks team right now beats Milwaukee or, or Boston um, or even Miami in round two. I don't think they have the offensive firepower. So I think Orlando would be a fun pick to make a run. I don't like the Pacers um, because of their defense, but I'm going to be kind of, I don't think it's chalky to make a run dark horse in the East, but I'm going to go the Miami Heat. Like the Pelicans, they're one of the best defensive teams in the league. They're a top five defensive team this year. And in the playoffs, that's going to matter. And we know that this team, I mean, it depends. Like I said with the Pelicans, if they got Denver in round one, I don't like them to make a run. If Miami got Boston in round one, I don't like them to make a run. If Miami gets Cleveland in round one, I like them to make a run. <sighs> Milwaukee will be interesting. Milwaukee would be interesting. But right now, they're the seventh seed. You go up against Philly in like one of the play-in and that's kind of like must win because going up against Milwaukee in a seven game playoff series is so different than going up against Boston this year in round one but uh, Miami's getting Tower Hero back soon so they should be relatively healthy for the playoffs I know they lost Max Schroes from last year's team and Gabe Vincent but Nikola Jovic is a completely different player this year completely different player looks way more confident with the shot in his hands and you have Hamley Hawkes who looks like uh, someone that could at least be a relatively net positive bench score for you in the playoffs they traded for terry rozier who i know the defense sometimes isn't there in the playmaking but he is an upgrade over kyle lowry and what he was for this team last year you're gonna get tower hero you didn't have him for the playoffs last year and i know they went to the finals without him but that's still something good to have and duncan robinson has been one of the more improved players year over year and we saw how important he was to that playoff team last year so i know the uh the big man depth isn't great um, but that I think could be fine for the playoffs. I think the Miami Heat are poised again, depending on how the seeding matches up to make a conference finals appearance. 
Like if it's if it's Miami Cleveland in round one, I'm taking Miami. If it's Miami Orlando round one, I'm taking Miami. If it's it's not going to end up being Miami Indiana, but I would obviously take Miami. If it's Miami New York, it would be tough, but I think I would go Miami. I think it's going to be. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. If I think the Pacers aren't going to hold on to that sixth spot, I think they're going to end up as a playing tournament team. I mean, I think it would be very fun to go like it would be like Indiana Boston round one, but that, or excuse me, Indiana Milwaukee. That's probably not going to happen. I, I feel like if Indiana gets Philly in the playing tournament, it's going to go to Philly. But I don't know. This playing tournament is going to be fun this year because two like two out of the three of Indiana, Miami, and Philly are going to be in the playing tournament. So that's going to be fun, like extra basketball. And like Chicago and Atlanta could be fun at times and they're fringy. They're going to be borderline 500, but they're not going to probably make it out of the plane. And for the West, you're going to have possibly the Pelicans, Kings, Lakers, and Warriors. Like you're definitely going to have the Warriors. I mean, you may have the Lakers, you may have the Mavericks, the Suns, depending on how this final like weekish ends up. But the playing tournament's going to be the best it's ever been, which I'm happy to see. We have more talent in this league and a little bit more competitiveness this year, even though I'm not really a big fan of the playing tournament because... I'd rather just see Miami and Philly automatically make the playoffs. We don't really need to see an extra game from Chicago or in Atlanta. Um, and then four or two extra games, I guess, for one of those teams. And for the West, like, I'm fine if Golden State, like, I don't know. This would be a very fun playoff stretch if, like, Sacramento was the eight seed at 44 and 32. And the Lakers are half a game behind and the Warriors are two games behind. Like, that, this would be a fun final two weeks where these teams are playing for their season. But, you know, the playing tournament should be good this year but more in the Western Conference. So my two Dark Horse teams, West the Pelicans and the Heat, the or excuse me, the Eastern Conference team will be the Heat, mainly because I think they have enough offensive talent and the game will slow down in the playoffs and their defense is there. They both play super physical, which I think will matter in these playoff series, but it really just depends on who they get matched up in round one. So it will be those, but the two contingencies on that, if the Pelicans somehow get Denver in round one or if the Heat somehow get boston around one then i don't like those two teams all right so my next question is going to be from jack uh dunbar he says how real are some young teams like the thunder and the timberwolves are they legit contenders or are they uh per just performing well in the regular season how much does experience matter when it comes to the playoffs so i i think for both these two teams it's interesting right now because i i feel like for minnesota at least we can kind of start with first like they've been hovering around here at the number one spot without carl anthony towns as of late um nazarita stepped up and this team, like I liked a ton about New Orleans and Miami, they play physical. They're a great defensive team. Like Jaden McDaniels, like he was hurt for the playoffs last year and he will be there out there this year and he's going to be able to guard team's best defenders. And like OKC has been a top 10 defensive team this year. But for more on Minnesota, I think experience does matter, but they do have experience nonetheless. I mean, like Carl Anthony Towns hasn't had a ton of playoff success, but he's not someone that's 22 years old. If he's fully healthy for the playoffs, he should be effective, but I don't know if that's going to come in round one, which will be like, you need guys to create your own shots. And outside of Anthony Edwards on this team, if Cat is not playing, I don't really love any shot creators on this team. Gobert is obviously not creating his own shot. As much as I like Nas Reed, I have to see it in the playoffs before I can believe it with him. Mike Conley's not creating his own shot. McDaniels is definitely not creating his own shot right now. Naw has some potential. Like they need somebody to break out here. Um, and I don't know how much I rely on Minnesota to make it out of round two if Cat is still hurt or if he's playing through an injury. So I worry a little bit more about Minnesota even though they're a better defensive team than OKC and they have um, a little bit more experience and Gobert will help, but we've seen Gobert in the playoffs. It hasn't been kind to him. It hasn't whatsoever. Teams could play him off the floor because they need a little bit more offense, but for Minnesota, they don't really have a lot of offense off the bench, so they're going to rely on him a ton, and they have Anthony Edwards, who seriously needs to carry this team. So I think for Minnesota, it's like, are we going to see Anthony Edwards transcend into a top five player in this league in the playoffs? Because I think that's their chance to make it out of round two and make it to the conference finals because I think what the Mavericks, what the Clippers have over them right now is they have multiple guys that can create their own shot. And if Luke is off, Kyrie's on. If Kawhi's off, PG could be on. I mean, there's a lot more variance with that Clippers team. And even with Phoenix, if Booker or KD's off, the other one could be on. It's at least, I think, what I saw in the playoffs with some of these teams last year. Like, I think we saw that with the Grizzlies in round one against the Lakers and how they struggled to really get some offensive creation in the half court. I think, we, like I said, we saw that with the Knicks in round two against the Miami Heat. They struggled to get some shot creation. We saw that with the Cavs in round one, how Mobley and Allen could not play well together. And just one big man alone, Mitchell Robinson, was better than those two. And Darius Garland was too inconsistent. So I'm a little bit worried about Minnesota's offense in the playoffs. And I think it depends on who they get matched up with. But they could, like, if they get the Pelicans in round one, 
that's a tough that's a tough matchup for sure um but for okc they're a little bit worse defensively than minnesota but if they're fully healthy for the playoffs i think uh, j-dub is for real like they have shea coaches alexander equivalent to anthony edwards in minnesota but j-dub is i think i i think i trust j-dub a little bit more in this playoffs uh than carl anthony towns who's coming off an injury and I don't think he's like, I don't know. I think I just trust J-Dub who gets to his shots on floaters and mid-range jumpers. And he is so efficient. Like Jalen Williams is one of the best young players in this league. And I think he can really put the, um, put himself on the map on a national stage in the playoffs. Now I do worry about some of the experience for OKC and Gordon Hayward. That experiment has been a disaster. And yeah, in hindsight, they probably should have got some type of big man depth at the deadline. But I think I like, I think OKC's come down to like size. And like, that's why it would be a fun fun ass matchup if we got minnesota and okc in these playoffs because okc has a little bit more run and gun to them a little bit more offensive like shot creation in the half court but minnesota can just dominate them on the boards which we've seen like teams like do recently um against um okc and we'll see because like chet's been banged up a little bit or it's more been more shea and jada but they'll be healthy for the playoffs but the thunder have been relatively healthy this year i think uh, i would still take denver over both these teams um i think i'm a little bit more worried with minnesota um but I think there are their their weaknesses to both teams. And I think if they either one got Dallas, either one of them got New Orleans um, or Clippers in round two, which it's looking like that could happen. Um, I, I'm not really in love with those two teams in OKC and Minnesota. I think they match up well against Phoenix. I'm not too worried about them. They match up well against Sacramento. I think they'd be fine against the Lakers, but it would be interesting nonetheless. All right, question number three uh, comes from guam i'm not gonna try to pronounce that full username but he says wemby versus chet was such an entertaining rookie of the year race to start the season since you've been analyzing basketball what was your favorite rookie of the year race so i think it comes down to um a couple maybe like i'm basically going off of i don't think like i mean i was making youtube videos and doing stuff at this time um but i think my favorite rookie of the year race just like as a fan has to be the 2017 rookie of the year race which came down between ben simmons and donovan mitchell there's a couple other ones that i liked as well that i'll go into but it was fun because it was so neck and neck it felt like for most of the season and there was like the adidas campaign from donovan mitchell that said like rookie question mark i even bought the shirt i don't know why because i had a ben simmons jersey and i loved him at lsu and when he was a rookie for philadelphia I just maybe thought the shirt was kind of cool. But yeah, Ben Simmons was not, quote unquote, a rookie from the previous draft class. It's like what we're seeing from Chet this year, what we've seen with Blake Griffin in the past. Um, ben Simmons was in the 2016 draft class. He should have been a 2017 rookie when Malcolm Brogdon won rookie of the year, but he was out all that year. So his true rookie year was the Donovan Mitchell, Tatum, Kuzma, even Dennis Smith Jr. finished top five in that rookie class um, in rookie of the year voting for the 2018 season Simmons ended up with 16 points eight rebounds and eight assists two steals as well um he finished first with 91st place votes um Donovan Mitchell finished runner-up in Utah um they were both 21 years old which is kind of cool as well um because Mitchell was a little bit older coming out of Louisville um Donovan Mitchell got 11 first place votes he finished with 20 points four rebounds and four assists the efficiency was okay 43 percent from the field 34 from three 81 from the line and uh, Donovan Mitchell, like when he was young in Utah, was looked at as a pretty good defender out of the gate. And he led Utah to beating OKC in round one um, in that 2018 season. So he accomplished a little bit more, at least throughout the playoffs. And I think... I think in hindsight, it still should have went to Simmons because overall playmaking ability, rebounding defense, I value that more. Now what we know, though, it's kind of funny how their careers kind of went, I wouldn't say opposite directions. Like they were probably neck and neck until that 2021 season. And then Mitchell stayed on that like elite path. And then Simmons obviously cratered and nobody really th uh, saw that coming. But that was a fun rookie of the year race, I would say. Um, the 2021 rookie of the year race from the 2020 draft class was super fun as well between Lamella Ball and Anthony Edwards. Lamella Ball ended up winning. And it's funny because now like Anthony Edwards came in second better than Lamelo Ball and then Halliburton in third you can make an argument better than Lamelo Ball um but yeah Lamelo got 84 first place votes he uh had 16 points six rebounds six assists 43 from the field 35 from three 75 from the line Anthony Edwards finished second with 15 first place votes 19 points five rebounds three assists uh the efficiency wasn't great 41 from the field 32 from three 77 from the line and I think they probably got the right guy and Lamelo Ball winning it it's just funny how like kind of those two career I don't know Lamelo just had his injury history and Anthony Edwards is on another planet right now um, but that was a really fun rookie of the year race in that second half of the year as well um, between those two guys and then the last one I would say I think the 2022 rookie of the year race was fun between the 2021 draft class because there was three guys at a time that could win it um, it ended up slightly going to Scotty Barnes over Evan Mobley but Cade Cunningham really made a name for himself in that second half of the year because he got off to an abysmal start 
in the first half of the year for Detroit. Uh, Scotty Barnes ended with 48 first place votes uh, on 15.7 rebounds, three and a half assists. Evan Mobley, 43 first place votes. Um, so super close, 15, eight and two and a half. Um, pretty good efficiency. And I think better defense at the time than Scotty Barnes. Um, and then Cade Cunningham finished with nine first place votes, 17 and a half points, five and a half rebounds, five and a half assists. The efficiency wasn't great, but that was a really fun rookie of the year race from those three. I just think in the last five years, those ones were pretty notable. I think Ja pretty much had it I mean, like the 2021, I remember it was such a shit show for discourse on that because Zion barely played um, before the season shut down. Like it was like 30, less than 30 games or whatever. And I remember guys like Colin Coward, like he was the lead in those 30, like 30 ish games, but Colin Coward and like those guys were like, yeah, like he should still win it. Like it doesn't matter. But like Embiid didn't win rookie of the year in that 20, what was it, 16 season with kind of the lack of games played. Like Kendrick Nunn ended up finishing second in that rookie of the year. Zion ended up playing in 24 games. He did average 22 points and six rebounds, and he was a fun player, but like Ja ended up getting 99 first place votes. One vote did go to Zion, funny enough. All right, next question comes from Tyler's World. He says, any chance the Celtics blow it up if they don't make the finals? And is Jason Tatum good enough to be a number one option based on his struggles in the playoffs? Oh man, so for the Boston Celtics, it's definitely finals or bust this season. If they don't make it to the finals, it's a failure of a season just because of them being by far the best team in the NBA throughout the regular season. They are going to finish with, I mean, they're 60 and 16 right now. If they technically win out, they could finish with 66 wins, which is a damn good, impressive season. Do I think the Celtics blow it up? Absolutely not. I think you run this team back. I think the biggest move that they would make if they were to lose in the conference finals or before that god forbid is they fire joe missoula um i think that would be the biggest move and maybe they try to do a sign and trade with drew holiday to upgrade the bench that would be also the biggest move but i think Derek white will be back next year he is due for an extension um in 2026 so next year is his last year you'd think they would want to work out something with him um would they move maybe Al Horford or Peyton Pritchard is a possibility and they have a little bit of draft capital but like Tatum's obviously not going anywhere he's gonna get that super max soon Chris stops he's too important to this team isn't going anywhere and same with Derek White I think they'd work out an extension before they traded him I think Drew's that interesting one he has a 40 million dollar player option that if he opts out of I mean you have a chance of losing him for nothing but he could opt in and then get traded or you could just opt out and sign an extension with boston and just get more total money than 40 million um which is a possibility i, I remember hearing like drew kind of doesn't want to play that much longer in the nba um but i do think if boston loses before the nba finals uh missoula has gone which is crazy because if they lose in the conference finals in seven games to milwaukee i don't know maybe missoula would be back they would have to lose in like four or five or maybe even six to like a, an inferior team to milwaukee maybe if it's miami again or or Cleveland, or I hope New York. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I don't think Boston blows it up uh, unless they lost in like round one, and then maybe they reevaluate everything. But if they got Miami in round one, that'd be fun. Um, and as for Tatum's struggles in the playoffs as a number one option, I don't really know if he does struggle. I mean, he wasn't great against the Warriors in the 22 finals, but he was phenomenal in last year's playoffs. Like his numbers were great um, in round ones and two against um, Atlanta and then Philly and winning in seven and being down three games to two. The Miami game, he did struggle a little bit from three. And I think that's what Tatum needs to realize sometimes is he's not the most elite three-point shooter in the world. And he can get to the rim whenever he wants. And maybe he should stop taking threes if like he realizes it's not going on well in the playoffs. But he was good in 2021's like shortened playoffs, like in that Brooklyn series, in my opinion. Um, in the 22 playoffs, like when they went to the finals, he was good in every series leading up to that Golden State one. So I don't know. I don't think Tatum's been a bad playoff performer. Obviously, you'd like for him to maybe get it done as the number one option and lead this team to a championship. And we could see that happen this year. Um, but it would be interesting to see if this Boston team doesn't even make the final. And the last question comes from Zeb. He says, should the Blazers trade Anthony Simons this offseason? If yes, should they do it for assets or to trade up in the draft? Um, in my opinion, this is not the draft to trade up for. I would not think about trading Anthony Simons to move up in the draft. Um, obviously, Alex Saar would be a beautiful fit here because you could finally have a defensive-minded five. And I think fits the timeline a little bit more with Scoot Henderson. And I think I would be more excited about him at the five spot going forward than Robert Williams or DeAndre Aiden. But I don't hate the idea of Anthony Simons getting moved out of this team because I do wonder the fit of Sharp, Simons, and Scoot together. And I think Scoot's on the right path to still being your franchise point guard. And I, call me crazy, but I think Sharp still has more upside over Simon. Simon's going to be 25 next year. He missed some time this year. Um, there's overall some inefficiencies on twos from him, but he's a lights out three point shooter. Um, he's a good enough combo guard where he's going to be a fine playmaker, in my opinion. I think like I think the decision would have to come. 
I don't know if Scoot and Simons could win together in that backcourt. I think it would have to become the question, who do you think is your franchise point guard? Anthony Simons are, or Scoot Henderson? And could Simons really ball out on a bigger stage? He hasn't really had too much kind of, like, I guess experience in the playoffs like on the blazers um he was on the roster in the 2019 playoffs because he was in the 2018 class um when they made it to the conference finals to lose to golden state i forgot yeah they got swept by them in that 2019 season he like never played um he did play 20 minutes a night in the the lakers five game loss in the bubble and then uh, against Denver in six games in the 2021 um, round one playoffs, but he didn't really do much. So we haven't really seen Simons, especially this version of Simons, which really kind of came around two years ago um, and they didn't make the playoffs. And then Mike Lasher didn't make the playoffs as well, obviously. So I think, I don't know, it's going to be an interesting like situation. He makes 24 million this year, 25 and a half million next year, 27 and a half million in 26 and is an unrestricted free agent in 27. I don't think you move Simons this off season, but this is probably where his value could be at the all-time high. I think like this team could use a wing. I don't know though, because I hate that like that four spot is like a log jam from Jeremy Grant and you would have to move on that bad contract. And that five spot is still DeAndre Aiden, who's making so much money at that five spot, 32 million plus for the next three years. I hate the Grant contract. I don't like the Aiden contract. I don't know, man. It's going to be interesting just saying like off season for the Blazers. I wouldn't bring back Chauncey Billups. I wouldn't like not trade Brogdon. I would move Brogdon for sure. If you can move Grant and Aiden, yes, please do that. Um, if you can move Thibel, I would do that. Like, let's have this influx of young talent. Uh, I just wonder about the fit between Simon, Scoot, and Sharp, but I would give it a little bit more time. I would see what they can do next year. And then I think after next year, going into the 2025 offseason, when Simons has that last year on that contract, then you kind of evaluate next year. But I think you try to get a different head coach and maybe try to change up this team's identity. Because if it's like the same team, you're at a top 10 pick, Brogdon's still on the roster, Grant's still on the roster, Aiden's still on the roster, and you win, I don't know, they won, they're at 20 and 56. Say they go to, I don't know, 30, 30 and 52 next year. They win like eight-ish more games, 10-ish more games. Uh, I don't really think that's enough. I don't know. I think you got to figure out the core of Scoot, Sharp, and Simons. And if it's not going to work, then you move Simons before you move Sharp or you move Scoot Henderson. So yeah, that is going to be for me. I hope you guys did enjoy this episode. I guess I have a mailbag of the Just Ballin podcast. Let me know what you guys think on YouTube. If you enjoyed, drop a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. And if you want to partake in the next mailbag, just make sure you're subscribed on the channel. I'm going to ask on the community tab um, any questions. So thank you guys that asked questions. It was a perfect amount. And I think we hit a different kind of uh, variety of topics in the NBA. Um, and if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Podcast or Spotify, I'd appreciate five star rating and review. If you did enjoy, I would appreciate that a ton. Or just follow the pod if you are not already. And I will catch you guys in Monday's episode where I think I'm going to talk about my top 10 college teams since 2010. There's a, I'm like kind of iffy on that because I'm going to pre record it. If I have enough time, I want to get it done. Um, and then Wednesday's pod will be probably my reaction to the national championship game because I'm flying back to Philadelphia Wednesday morning. So I'll have time to record that to get that out for uh, you guys on Wednesday. So yeah, thank you guys all for watching and listening. I'll catch you guys in Monday's episode. Have a good weekend.